Hello, welcome to, back to the book, Berkeley Book Chat series. I'm Stephen Best, the director of the Townsend Center for the Humanities. I know I promised we'd be back in person starting the semester. Uh, sadly, the construction continues on Stevens Hall, so we're having to remain online for the month of February. So please check the Townsend Center's website for the most up-to-date information about our events. We're pleased to begin our spring book, book chat series with Tony Cascardi, the anchor distinguished professor of comparative literature, rhetoric, and Spanish, and the former Dean of Arts and Humanities at Berkeley. Tony is also a previous director of the Townsend Center for the Humanities, so we're particularly delighted to have him kick off our spring series. Tony has written books on Cervantes and the Spanish Golden Age. He has also published the Cambridge Introduction to Literature and Philosophy and edited the volume Art and Aesthetics after Adorno. He joins us today to discuss his most recent book, Francisco de Goya and the Art of Critique. Tony's interlocutor is Dan Blanton, an English department colleague and current director of the program in critical theory. Dan specializes in modernism and aesthetic theory. Before, before I turn things over to Tony and Dan, I'd like to draw your attention to a few upcoming Townsend Center events. On March 1st, Sian Nye, the Mellon Professor of English at the University of Chicago, will deliver this year's Avenali Lecture. The event will take place in person in the Mod Five room in Wheeler Hall at five o'clock in the evening. And then on March 2nd, Sian will be joined by Colleen Lai and Damon Young for a faculty panel on her talk. Our next book chat will take place next Wednesday on February 8th, when we'll be joined by Nicholas Matthew, a professor in the Department of Music, to discuss his recent book, The Haydn Economy, Music, Aesthetics, and, and Commerce in the Late 18th Century. Nick will be joined by Emily Dolan, a professor in the Brown University Department of Music, and herself a scholar of Haydn and 18th and 19th century European music. That's it for now, and I'll turn it to you, uh, Dan and Tony. Thanks, Stephen, and uh, welcome, welcome everyone, uh, especially Tony, uh, to I suppose our virtual Jabal room. Um, as we uh, as we await the uh, completion of of the of the reborn Stevens Stevens Hall, um, let me say just a couple of things um, about this uh, intricately argued, lavishly illustrated, uh, and wonderfully comprehensive um, book, and recommend recommend that everyone. Uh, as Tony begins begins to unpack it for us, uh, consider the uh, the two halves of the conjunction uh, in play here: um, Francisco de Goya and the art of critique. Because I will suggest uh, to begin with that it is precisely the relation uh, between these between these two components um, that develops over the series of, as I say, extensive, intricate, and lavishly illustrated, wonderfully produced. Um, text uh, that we are delivered um, by zone. Stephen mentions uh, that, uh, that Tony, in addition to being the former director of the Townsend Center and the, uh, and the recent uh, Dean of Arts and Humanities, um, holds, I believe, um, about his appointments in about as many of the departments of that unit, that division, uh, as any of our colleagues. Um, but to start off, I'll ask him a slightly provocative question. Uh, and notice that unless I missed something, one of those was not art history. Uh, and so Tony, you advert to this a little bit in the acknowledgements to the, uh, to the book, um, but if you could say something about how you came uh, to this encounter with art history, we could call it that. Uh, hi, Dan, thank you. Thank you so much for taking the time to read the book uh, and for being here to uh, engage in this conversation about it. Uh, I'll give you a, a short answer to that question, and I could follow that up if, uh, if we have time with a much more robust answer. Um, the short answer, uh, it lies in the relationship between research and teaching. And we, we very often say, and it's true, that at a research university, our teaching is, uh, is deeply informed by the research that we do. But in this case, it actually happened the other way. 
the research was in fact instigated by a teaching assignment. And the teaching assignment now many, many decades ago was a course in one of my departments, the Spanish department on the subject of Spanish culture. And I decided to include three artists, three visual artists in that course, Velázquez, Goya, and Picasso. And since it was a, a course on culture, the questions were really quite contextual about their work. And I was uh, able to do reasonably well with Velázquez because of the work that I had done in the Spanish Golden Age, the Renaissance Early Modern Period, and with Picasso, because of the work that I had done very, very early on, actually late in graduate school on the avant-garde. But Goya, when the week uh, for Goya started approaching, I realized that I was quite stumped. And I, I was stumped because there were so many different Goyas, it seemed to me. Uh, the looks of which, I mean, the looks of the images uh, not resembling one another at all, and in fact, seeming quite contradictory. So I can't actually recall now how I managed that week. I, I obviously got, got through it and hopefully uh, didn't do too much damage to the, to the students, but the puzzle of Goya and the tremendous diversity of the work, the apparent internal contradictions of the work, and the challenge then of saying something about that work as a whole remained with me and evolved, uh, simmered, uh, went to the back burner, reappeared many times over the course of many decades until I was in the end able to formulate something that I thought would be relatively coherent uh, about it. Um, and if, uh, if it would serve to give uh, those watching a sense of what this enormous diversity of work is like and how it appears quite contradictory in some ways uh, I've arranged for just a few slides, six or seven slides. Um, and I, I'd like to ask the, the folks at the Townsend Center if we could run through them just very quickly. I don't intend to dwell on any of them, but just to give a sense of the enormous uh, diversity, as I said, of, of, Goya's, uh, of Goya's work. Um, let's see, we're, we're already racing through some of them. The first one, one of the so-called black paintings of a semi-sunken dog. This a still life from, there we go, there's the, there's the dog. Um, the second, uh, a still life of, uh, from a, a butcher shop apparently, uh, it had uh, some ribs. Uh, next slide, please. This, uh, the very well-known frontispiece of his etchings called the Caprichos. Um, there's something you might observe quite interesting about the, the caption on this, it says Francisco Goya y Lucientes Pintor, which is to say painter. Uh, oddly, he portrays himself as a painter at the head of a collection of uh, images that are not at all paintings, they're etchings. Uh, next, uh, a rather late work, a self-portrait of Goya in his illness uh, being ministered to by a doctor named Arieta. Uh, very, I think, touching, moving uh, portrait. Uh, next. Uh, one of his many portraits of aristocrats, this one hanging in the Metropolitan Museum in New York, a portrait of uh, Sebastián Martínez, very, very put together and proper. This, another of the black paintings of Saturn devouring his son. And I think this is our last image to share, uh, one of the so-called tapestry cartoons called the Parasol. These cartoons were uh, sketches essentially that Goya made to be handed over to the tapestry makers in the Royal Tapestry uh, Factory. The point of running through these images is just to illustrate the, the tremendous diversity of Goya's work uh, and how uh, on the one hand, something as luminous, as uh, lush, uh, as filled with light and a very adept use of light and shadow in the parasol uh, it seems to be a, pol a polar opposite of something like the Saturn devouring his son with pretty much everything in between. So the question that instigated the book for a non-art historian, which is what you, what you asked me, was how to say something about this work. Uh, sometimes I, I would phrase my, my problem as would the real Francisco de Goya please stand up? Um, in any case, that was the instigation. Yeah, it strikes me that what originates as 
as a sort of discovered pedagogical problem of having to figure out what one is teaching next. Turns out in this case to, to divulge something about the truth of the object. Uh, and for those of us coming from, from still further away who know perhaps uh, the sleep of reason or the black paintings or, or what have you, um, much of what strikes one immediately is not only the breadth uh, in all of the uh, samples that we've seen and the 150 more, I believe, included in the, in the text, but also, also the apparent contradiction um, between, between these modes. It's easy enough, again, for, for an interested amateur to think of Velasquez as a sort of coherent formal ideology of a sort, right? A kind of neoclassical perfection realized. Picasso, obviously, uh, in, in the 20th century through cubism as, as, a, sort of, as a sort of construction of um, a coherent, a coherent uh, aesthetic ideology. It seems more difficult in Goya's case, even apart from, from one's familiarity. There is also a kind of ambition that seems to be forced by that of needing to account for Goya whole. Um, and apart from, from just the sort of individual stylistic contradictions of Goya, could I get you to say something about that? Uh, about the need obviously to read uh, in fine detail so many of these images, but always with an idea to postulating an entire figure, a sort of organized intelligence of, of Goya. Here, not ascribable merely to psychology or biography or any of the simple political events uh, that we associate with the time, but this sort of object of Goya. Uh, a great question, Dan, thank you. Uh, I, I very much appreciate the, the phrase that you used in organized ideology in the case of uh, Velasquez or in the case of uh, cubists. And one of the things that uh, came to strike me about Goya was that in fact, there was no ideology as such. Uh, that in looking for an organized ideology, one would be looking for the wrong thing. And similarly, that in looking for what I would call the artist's signature, I mean, the traits of style that are consistent throughout the work, one would be looking for the wrong thing. Those are very likely reasonable places to look, reasonable things to look for, but in fact mistaken uh, in this case. And what I discovered uh, could provide an account of the work as a whole was something more like an activity. And that activity was in fact the activity of critique. And that activity uh, allowed me to understand what Goya was up to and pursuing, I think, uh, relentlessly uh, regardless of the particular circumstances in which he was working, that is to say, regardless of whether he was working as a court painter, regardless of whether he was working uh, essentially on his own when he, he made the etchings of the caprichos, uh, regardless of whether he was on uh, working for uh, as a, doing a religious commission, he was consistently involved in an activity. And the nature of that activity which I came to understand as critique, seemed to me to be one of the keys to understanding what Goya was relentlessly up to over the course of, of his career. The, um, the uh, critique, of course, uh, sort of language and terminology that we, uh, that we tend to associate as criticism with art history and as, as critique um, with philosophy. Um, what happens, uh, if I can ask it this way, uh, when one treats a painter uh, as the sort of vehicle of something like a philosophical system that isn't finally philosophical, that is happening in a non-discursive medium, that is happening in a kind of non-conceptual range, but nonetheless begins to betray exactly this kind of coherence uh, that one might expect from a sort of thoroughgoing activity, uh, as you put it, of critique. Well, let me say that was that's just inc an incredibly thrilling experience to to discern that in the visual uh, media that Goya worked in, to see the project of critique being carried out uh, in a form that was not that of language, that it was not discursive, uh, of posing questions, as it were, probing answers, exploring. 
uh, responses that had been given in, by other artists and other circumstances, working in a, in a medium that was not principally that of language. I say not principally because there is some language in the captions of the Caprichos and in the captions of the, uh, of the disasters of war, very special cases both. But it was just absolutely thrilling to see this work happening in the form of a visual medium. And my, my answer uh, would in fact take the form of another question and that's why not? Why, why would one not be able to pursue a project of critique in a form that does not involve language? In fact, you might say that language puts some uh, inherent limitations on a project of critique. Uh, la language is, a, is a extraordinarily versatile, but also has its limitations. And so to see what could be achieved by way of critique in a medium that was not that of language was just, I can't say how thrilling it was. So say more about the sort of objects on which uh, the, the activity of critique lands. Um, we begin uh, in the book, for those who haven't had a chance to, uh, to sink in yet, um, with the San Antonio frescoes uh, and the tension in Goya's handling of inherited traditional sacred uh, materials before, before moving outward in the tapestry cartoons to a sort of more topical and social, social range, sometimes verging even on something uh, perhaps mildly, mildly satirical. Um, as, as we've suggested already, this is perhaps not the Goya uh, that most of us immediately uh, associate associate with a name, but it brings his work into first in the first in the sacred images and then in the secular ones uh, into a kind of into a kind of social field uh, that that opens up along the way. Talk about what happens with with Goya's turn into this into this uh, into into this space, um, but also what the activity of critique discovers there, uh, what it what it finds. Let me say a couple of things. Uh, first off, the, you asked about the objects of his critique and uh, corresponding to the tremendous diversity of these images uh, of which we saw a brief sample, the objects of his critique are pretty much everything. Um, and so there's a thoroughness about the project that is reflected in the diversity of the objects uh, toward which he uh, directs his critical, his gaze, the project of critique that is. Uh, and I think that in order to be as thorough as Goya wanted to be, as he turned out to be, uh, he had to be extraordinarily encompassing in the, the, in the regions toward which he directed his project of critique. Um, in, in that regard, he's a little bit like, although they're very different from, a little bit like Kant. Um, the, the idea is to call everything into question and to bring into the project of critique um, everything such that the things that we know can actually stand on some kind of firm ground. The question of what survives the project of critique and where that firm ground is is another um, issue that we could, we could talk about. But yes, uh, the religious sphere attracts his critical gaze, uh, but so to politics, so to history, so to the society around him, uh, so to the, the entire arena of psychology, of, of desires and impulses. So it's a vast, uh, it's a vast palette um, that is involved in this, in this project of critique. By specifically directing his attention to society as he does in the Caprichos, he's, um, he's looking at things that are very, very proximate, that are very nearby. He's looking at the world that surrounds him. Uh, and part of what he's seeing in that world is the fact that the inhabitants of it are quite unaware of uh, their own failings. They're quite unaware of their own superstitions. They're quite unaware of their own prejudices. Uh, they're quite unaware of their own, their own biases. They're quite under, uh, unaware of their own narcissism. Um, and so it's not simply the narcissism, the bias, uh, the prejudice, the superstition that Goya is targeting. It's actually the lack of self-consciousness about those things that he is targeting. And 
one of the key elements of a project of critique is of course the element of self-consciousness. And that is in fact, uh, I believe one of the things that distinguishes a project of critique from a project of simple criticism. Does it, is it, how even to formulate this, formulate this question? Um, obviously that self-consciousness is available to us uh, and is available we hope it seems to go, to, go uh, to what degree is that self-consciousness available or can we even answer the question in the real moment? Um, those figures sitting for a portrait uh, or, or rendered in some of the, some of the extreme historical um, images. That is to say, is Goya sort of, is sort of projecting this possibility, formal possibility in a Kantian uh, sense perhaps of self-consciousness forward or is it happening in real time um, the uh, to what degree is there a kind of active agency uh, in Goya's moment um, of that critical activity well I, I wish I knew uh, a, the certain answer to that question uh, but since I don't I'll take a I'll take a stab at what might be a, a good guess and I think the good my, my best guess is that there is for Goya in the moment, the capacity to be there and present in the moment and also distanced from the moment, distanced from what's happening. And I think that's in fact what enables him to accomplish what he, what he has accomplished. So it's that distance, in some cases it shows up as irony, uh, in some cases it shows up as a very cutting, uh, with a very cutting edge sarcasm in, in fact, um, but always with a kind of duality that shows you, I think, uh, an artist who is both there in the moment and also somewhat distanced from the moment with that self-awareness and self-consciousness that he brings to the scene uh, that others involved may not uh, in fact have. Yeah. Uh, and I think if I could just elaborate a little bit and this, this will help complete the story uh, that I was beginning to tell in response to your question of the origins of this, of this book. I think Goya learned some of this by his early experiences of a very technical and, and material sort. And I got some insight uh, into this pro learning process, I think, on two occasions. Um, one was a visit to the tapestry factory in Madrid, uh, where in fact the tapestries from Goya's so-called cartoons, his, his painted sketches for these tapestries uh, were made. Uh, and I saw two things that were quite impressive uh, on that visit. One was to see that the tapestries themselves are far uh, clunkier than Goya's images. That what the tapestry weavers had to do, what they were able to do, uh, maybe they weren't the most expert tapestry weavers in the world, who knows. But in any case, they were much more schematic than what Goya was painting. But Goya obviously saw the tapestries that were made from his work. So he understood that there was some kind of translation process that was happening in between the image that he made and the tapestry that was going to hang in some royal residence. And the second thing was to watch how the tapestry weavers worked, which was from behind the loom with the image on the other side of the loom. So they were looking at an image, but remaking that image on the loom from behind. So Goya obviously saw what a tapestry weaver had to be able to see in making the tapestry from behind. Mm -hmm. So that ability to see something re reversed was, was quite striking. And the second was a visit to the um, Academy of uh, Fine Arts, the Academia San Bernardo de Bellas Artes in Madrid, where the royal engravery is. And there, anyone, you can see the copper plates of the, the etchings. And I saw the copper plates of the caprichos. And what struck me, uh, you mentioned I'm not an art historian, and so an art historian may have already known all this, but I didn't. Uh, what struck me was the fact that everything on the plates was reversed, not just light and dark, but left and right. And so 
Goya, who made these plates, had to be able to see the world that he was depicting in these etchings from a completely reverse standpoint. So I think that that ability to maintain that kind of double awareness of both what things look like and what things might look like otherwise differently, askance, awry, upside down, backwards. I think that was something he learned. And I think he also learned some of this in making the frescoes on the dome of, the, uh, of uh, San Antonio de la Florida in, in Madrid. Uh, and for anyone watching, you're likely to have seen many Goya images in the Prado in Madrid and some other places. The San Antonio church is a little bit off the beaten path, but absolutely astounding. And a visit to the calcografia, the engravery, to see the plates of the etchings is, is absolutely thrilling. And an experiment in optics, if I follow the details yeah. of all of the readings precisely enough. The, uh, there, with both the engravings and, and the frescoes, um, one is struck by, by the sort of continual encounter uh, across Goy's career with something like that technological plasticity of the medium in, in, which, he's, in which he's working. Um, not, not easily reducible to the kind of, you know, notion of medium uh, and imitating of imitating that we later get with uh, Greenberg and a, and a certain modernism, but, a, but a, kind of, a kind of technical materiality of the entire thing. And it is striking too, uh, that in that, in that renewed discovery of the reversibility of the plates and, and all the rest, that this activity of critique for Goya seems never to launch him off into the sort of pure formalism uh, that we associate with Kant. And the encounter with Kant forms kind of, kind of one of the central dialogues um, at the core of the book, uh, but throws him back into the world. Um, if we think about critique in a Kantian vein as kind of the, the formalization of the conditions of possibility of experience, perception, perception, et cetera, it strikes me that Goya's version of critique is all about formal conditions of possibility as well, but they turn out to be quite different. Uh, they turn out to be, to be sort of insistently concrete um, and connected, never, never achieving that sort of pristine transcendence uh, of Kant, as if he's being pushed back uh, into the range of the real at every turn. I, I think that's absolutely right. And I think that's also uh, an answer to a question you, you raised earlier, which is about the uh, carrying out a project of critique in a medium that is not discursive. By carrying out in a material medium, uh, you are inescapably tied uh, to that, to the material world. And so the conditions of possibility will inevitably revolve around the easel, the canvas, the supports, the paint itself, the, uh, the concave surface of the dome, uh, the copper plates, the printing process, all of that is sort of in, inescapable. Uh, but the account that I give of Goya as uh, in the line of modernism or in relation to modernism in the arts in the book, uh, you're also right, is very different from, diverges from the kind of account that a Clement Greenberg would give, uh, a Clement Greenberg very much inspired by the abstract expressionists, uh, where the, the outcome of the project of critique for an artist and in relation to art history is something like freeing art from its ties to the world outside it, liberating it, allowing it to establish its autonomy. And my interpretation of Goya says rather that while that is part of what he does, he also understands that there are ties between the work and the world. There are ties between the work and the sphere of politics and history and religion. Uh, and, uh, and psychology. Uh, and all of those ties uh, are the places of engagement, of engagement for a project of critique that, uh, that requires art to be something other than purely abstract. 
Uh, and there are some images in the book and I make some comparisons with, uh, with a wonderful painting by Manet, a painting of an asparagus that is part asparagus and part just dripping, melting paint. I'm not sure I could have identified it without the, uh, without the caption, I'll confess. It's, it's pretty drippy. Uh, but take the image of uh, the still life that we saw from the butcher shop uh, when we ran through those images pretty, uh, pretty rapidly at the, at the outset. Uh, that's as much about paint as it is about st a still life, as it might be about the situation of famine in Madrid at the, at the time. It's about both things. And so Goya is continuously aware of and working with and through the material medium that he's involved with. He's, con he's continuously working with and in and through that. Uh, but he's also... Uh, casting his gaze and engaging with a, in a project of critique that goes outside that. Yeah, uh, yeah the, it, it strikes me then that one of the, one of the achievements um, of, of conjoining uh, Goya and critique in this way is to redefine abstraction in two directions, right? That we, uh, that we, have, a kind of, we have a kind of questioning of that art historical version of abstraction even as we have a kind of refusal or regrounding um, of the philosophical and, and Kantian one. And what emerges between them is, is I guess you put it this way a number of times, um, a, sort of, a sort of problem of figuration uh, that neither our art historical nor our, nor our philosophical um, tools, vocabulary, uh, quite prepare us to handle. Um, this may be a little bit too speculative, but but I wonder if you have an idea of a kind of art history after Goya uh, that attends, thinking of Monet and the sort of traditions that branch off there, uh, that attends more to figuration than abstraction. What happens if we sort of change the frame uh, of what we're looking at? In, in, I'll confess that in, in light of reading about Goya, it occurred to me that you know, maybe Picasso isn't actually all that abstract. Um, abstract expressionism might be, but I'm I'm not sure that Cubism isn't isn't sort of firmly firmly regrounded here. Uh, no, I think you're absolutely right about uh, about Cubism in, in that regard, and I think I'd also agree with that abstract expressionism. But l let me answer the question uh, in, in a slightly different vein uh, by saying that I think the the question of the problem of figuration. Um, suffers from a bad uh, initial formulation, a bad formulation that goes back a very, very long time. Uh, and the problem is, is, lies in the assumption that when one makes an image, the purpose is to make something that accurately and faithfully resembles something out there in the world. And you know, we could take this all the way back to Plato and Plato's critique of, of images and image making, uh, and as is quite well known, Plato saw the work of artists as, uh, as an inferior enterprise because they made copies of things and copies of things were by definition inferior to the, the things themselves. But what if we were to say that, uh, and what if we were to think that a, a figure, uh, whether it's a landscape, a human figure, uh, an architectural figure, um, both resemble something in the world, but doesn't, but differs from something in the world and differs in, in an important way. Um, then I think we kind of free ourselves up from a number of things. One is from um, the misunderstanding, the fundamental misunderstanding that goes back, you know, millennia, that the purpose of images is to make uh, likenesses of things in the world. But we also free ourselves from the art historical notion, uh, a past notion, I believe, that the most important thing for art to do was to free itself from figures because making figures made it subservient to things outside of art. So I think by, by recasting the question of figuration, uh, you in fact get a kind, of, a kind of liberating view of what art can be and what it can do. And Moreover, I think by maintaining a figure, 
the connection between art and the things in the world that we might think of as lying outside of art uh, is sustained. Um, and I think that is quite, quite important for a project of critique if it is going to be capacious, thorough, uh, and, and, and deep, mm -hmm. which I think Goya's work in fact is. Yeah, I, d I don't know if we, if, we can, if we can retrieve this image. Um, but of all the, uh, all the wash plates uh, in the book, I think the one that sticks with me most is the semi-submerged dog. Okay, yeah, um, maybe we uh, can. Townsend, seems Townsend to needs to be able to help. Here, uh, in, uh, in, this, in this use of figuration to open up a kind of non-memetic critical, uh, critical oh. space. Um, so maybe yeah. if I could just put you on the spot and ask you to say sure. something about this image. Um, What's, what strikes about this image is both what's there and what's not there. Uh, what's there is obviously the head of this dog. Uh, and, you know, we could all do our little roar shot and say what we think in, about the dog and what we think the dog is thinking and feeling and all that. But we do concretely see the head of a dog looking up at something that we can't see, uh, covered by something that we can't see. We can't see and we can't identify. So I think it's actually a, a great example of how Goya is working in this case, almost perfectly, both with what is uh, in the realm of the figure, the head of the dog, and what is in the realm of abstraction. Uh, there have been, there's all kinds of speculation about what Goya might have put behind the dog. There's speculation that it might be kind of an erased landscape uh, they've done x-rays of the painting, but in fact, what we have is a kind of, you know, a wash of, of color, many, many tones and color, and the head of this dog looking at something that the dog apparently sees and we can't. Um, and so uh, I think it's, in fact, uh, I'm glad you, you called this one up, Dan, because I think it's a really great example of how there is both figuration and if you want abstraction, take away the dog and, you know, this could be, who knows, you know, a Rothko or something. Mm -hmm. um, but, you know, take away the, the color fields and, you know, it could be, you know, some British 18th century <laughs> artist painting animals. No, it really, it really does fit wonderfully over a couple of centuries at least. And as you say, if you removed any element, um, it could be, it could be uh, sort of readapted or reinscribed in a number of, a number of pre-formulated critical narratives that as, as a whole object, um, it, it, seems, it seems to resist. The, um, there is also something, and maybe, maybe this is just a fondness of a dog, uh, fun is for the dog, but um, it, it strikes me that here, and one gets one gets a sense of the sort of, I want to say generosity or or humor uh, that is a little bit surprising, um, in uh, when one thinks thinks of Goya more generally, um, but is everywhere apparent uh, across the uh, across the images images in the book, and and I want to get you to to sort of point us in the direction. Uh, that you think this particular activity of critique um, points us to, uh, where does it? Where does it? Lead? We think of we think of a sort of Kantian version of critique um, as achieving through a formalization or a transcendentalization of uh, the conditions of possibility, a mode of autonomy, and a possibility of freedom. On the other side, we have a kind of Adornian gloom. Um, and the version of enlightenment uh, that the book uh, the book formulates has has sort of Adorno Horkheimer and Adorno on one side and Kant on the other. Um, thinking of Saturn devouring his children or the semi-submerged dog, uh, what is the kind of mood uh, with which we're left from this Goya? Um, I think in between, uh, as it were, Horkheimer and Adorno on the one hand and the dialectic of enlightenment and Kant on the other hand, we do in fact have Goya. And, and, and the question that I think can help us locate Goya is the question, what can survive, what does survive the project of critique in its, in its thoroughness? And 
you get one answer with Horkheimer and Adorno, and it's a, it's a rather bleak, bleak answer. And you get another answer with Kant, which is a you know, much more optimistic answer, but rather intangible. And so my sense is that Goya has his own version of, uh, of an answer. Uh, and that answer lies, as I try to set out in, I think it's the last chapter of the book, uh, something that I call sympathy. Uh, and I say I call sympathy, but in fact, it was a, uh, a category, uh, philosophical and psychological, widely in circulation in, in Europe in the, in the 18th century. And I think that the sympathy is, um, is, is a rela relational element. Uh, it's, it's both emotional and, and relational. Uh, that allows the artist to do something that Hannah Arendt actually said in her lectures on Kant's political philosophy that Kant was trying to, to do or asking us to do. And that is to put ourselves in the place of others, to put ourselves in the place in her language of everyone else. I think for Goya, it's not everyone else. It is putting oneself in the place of the other. Um, the other who might be the object of critique. Um, so it is, I think, a fuller, more generous version of self-consciousness that actually asks one to take account of the consciousness of the other and respond, and respond in a sympathetic way. And I think, in fact, that is one of the things Goya is demonstrating in that wonderful self-portrait with Dr. Arieta who is ministering to him. Uh, Goya both showing the sympathy that he received from the doctor, but painting this as a work of gratitude for Arieta. Do we have that image to hand? There we go. Yeah. And this is a very late piece, one of-, one it of is. It is a very, in fact, a very late piece. Uh, and so I'm very grateful for the question because I think it in fact does uh, help position Goya. And what I uh, argue is a nature of his response to questions that were at, have been asked by thinkers as diverse as Adorno and Horkheimer on the one hand in the 20th century and, and Kant. Um, and the, it strikes me as we turn to the, and the striking last, um, last uh, move uh, of the book to sympathy out of, out of, out of a more archly uh, poised um, version, version of critique does seem to, does seem to undertake a kind of programmatic, certainly generalization, if not universalization uh, of this older 18th century, um, more empirically uh, grounded um, account account of sympathy, um, and and takes us takes us indeed into uh, into uh, Hegel uh, from from the sort of Kantian Kantian anchorage anchorage as well, um, but does so in a way, and I think this image wonderfully catches it, uh, which suggests that really only art can do that work, right? That we don't quite have we don't quite have um, a sort of Kant doesn't allow us to do this. There is here an engagement with the dialectic of enlightenment, but there's also a kind of dialectically attuned version of enlightenment um, being being performed uh, in in images in images images like like these. Um, in that sense, I mean, maybe it only wraps back to the uh, one of the initial questions about taking taking art um, not merely as a sort of object of critique, but as its as its instrument. Uh, and in this case, this case perhaps a better one uh, than some of the uh, some of the philosophical philosophical tools to which we we otherwise um, otherwise take recourse. So let me say something uh, in response to that, and in fact something that will re return to your earlier question about uh, my my role as a non art historian and my involvement with the work of um, visual art. Yeah. Yes. And, and, and that is for, for a very long time, I had been working uh, with literature and the ways in which literature picks up and engages philosophical questions. 
and offers us versions of those questions and responses to those questions that are uh, certainly, whether they are substantively different from philosophical responses, they are certainly carried out, they're executed in a way that, that are not the ways of formal or informal philosophy for that, for that matter. And so the move to, to visual art for me was in some regards an extension of the same kind of thing that I had been doing with, with literature. And I'm, I'm saying this in part because uh, I, I wanna speak it also in defense of literature and I don't wanna make the visual art I don't believe that visual art has a capacity that no other medium has. It has a different capacity. But I think that literature is quite often engaged in doing a very similar kind of thing of, of asking questions, exploring answers um, in, in very, very complex ways, ways that often involve examples, clearly involve narrative, dialogue, drama, and, and all of those things that, you know, in many ways just also bring us back to what Plato was doing. Yeah. No, and picking up that, uh, that move of figuration away from the kind of constraint of, constraint of mimesis, um, whether we're talking about literature, music, visual arts, what have you, uh, doing so in a way that doesn't have to remain derivative, uh, doesn't have to remain secondary uh, to, these, to these sort of, to these sort of uh, larger conceptual discourses. Um, I think we have arrived uh, at the moment around a quarter of an hour, uh, quarter, quarter till, um, in which it's time to open, open the discussion up uh, and to, uh, to um, let, let everyone else uh, sort of formulate, uh, formulate their, own, their, own, um, their own questions. Um, First question is about uh, properly uh, the the etching plates and the uh, the um, the providence uh, of uh, of some of the uh, some of the uh, images here. Um, should we should we pull up some of the capriccio images just to? Um, I think we just have the one frontispiece. The uh, maybe that first self portrait of yeah. Uh, Goya. Yeah, but talk talk a little bit more about about some of the kind of technical format um, of some of these things, starting with, uh, with the caprichos and, and perhaps just give a sense of the range and, and breadth uh, of the caprichos as well, because they, they form a sort of central uh, reference in all of this. Yeah, uh, in, in fact they do. So um, interestingly, these were works that Goya did on his own. They were not uh, commissioned. Uh, he, he made them, he put them up for sale uh, they did not do well. He withdrew them rather uh, rapidly, um, but he was experimenting in, in a medium of, of etching and, and aqua tint. Uh, and there are many uh, subgenres of this uh, of this medium. Some depending on the kind of stylus that is used, depending on whether there is um, ink um, added with a brush afterwards. Um, one of the things. Uh, that is striking about the caprichos and about the etchings is that, and it's, it's entirely obvious, but is therefore easily overlooked, is that they're black and white. They're black and white and gray. And so the project of seeing the world, uh, as it were, in black and white and reversed uh, is an opportunity that is presented to Goya by the nature of this, of this medium. Um, he practiced a lot in the medium. He made some etchings, uh, direct copies of Velázquez. There's uh, an etched copy of Velázquez's famous painting, Las Meninas. And uh, one can, I think, rightly wonder what Goya was trying to do in creating uh, or refusing to create the kind of vo magical volume that Velázquez creates in that image. But back to the caprichos, they are arranged in two halves. This is the frontispiece. Um, it's rather striking because Goya is looking askance. He's looking, he's, a, he's avoiding that direct gaze of confrontation with the viewer or looking at himself in a mirror, whichever may be the case. Um, he's a man of the world. He's wearing a top hat and an overcoat, uh, it appears. And the first half of the caprichos are scenes that all take place by day. The second half uh, is introduced by the very famous image, the sleep, or if you want, dream of reason produces monsters, and all are scenes that take place at night. 
So we have this set of black and white and grayscale images that are divided between the light and the dark. Um, it turns out that what takes place is during uh, the daylight hours is at least as scary as what takes place during the hours of dark. Uh, but it's Goya's ability to see what's taking place both in broad daylight and under the cover of darkness. Uh, that, uh, that is a key to his rather unique position vis-a-vis -vis everything that he is surveying. And it is quite a broad, uh, a broad palette. There's something quite apt about the particular version of self-portraiture uh, that we have there sort of compared to Velasquez where we you know, tend to have him very prominently centered either as a, as a sort of visual focus or, or an object. Something about the, 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 uh, the sort of angle looking off to the side, um, never pictured full on a, a sort of sense that already our attention is being directed to something else uh, away, from, away from the person. Uh, the person of the painter. Um, first uh, first um, question, uh, sort of opening out more generally, um, it suggested that uh, Picasso in some ways rivals Goya uh, in terms of the diversity, think of the early, more figurative work of the blue period, analytic cubism and so on. Could you talk about some of the connections between the two, uh, Goya and Picasso? Um, either as you consider them now or as you discovered them when you taught the course in Spanish culture uh, a couple of decades ago? Well, let me first, first say that I, I by no means would, would attempt to claim that Goya is unique in the range, the diversity, the breadth, the contradictory qualities of the work. I would, I would by no means attempt to, to claim that. I, I don't know enough to claim it. And it seems just uh, sort of prima facie to be in, in, unlikely. Uh, so sure, Picasso may be as, as diverse, but you could say um, that is in some ways a function of their uh, reservoir of talent. By the, Goya could do pretty much anything and did pretty much everything for his time. And I think you could say the same of Picasso. Um, I think you could say the same of a contemporary German artist, the only other, I think the only other visual artist I've ever written anything about, Gerhard Richter. Richter who could paint absolutely anything. My question about Richter was if, if he could paint anything, why would he paint a blur? If he mm. could paint, it's a in similar, uh, similar question that we see about uh, in relation to Goya and figuration. Why didn't he just paint the street scene like it looked, because he could do that if he wanted. Um, Picasso, uh, and I, I'm I'm so far from being an authority on Picasso. What what I will say is really quite impressionistic, but P Picasso had a kind of appetite uh, for everything, and so you know Picasso's devouring examples. I think Picasso devoured Goya as Picasso devoured many, many things, including Velázquez. And so devouring Velázquez, devouring Goya is part of Picasso's uh, devouring the history of Spanish art. And, you know, we do sometimes uh, forget the fact that, you know, you know Barca Picasso's Barcelona origins and Spanish roots. Just anecdotally, I was briefly trying, probably failing, uh, to teach, um, teach a moment of early cubism uh, last semester. And one of the things that began to sort of, to sort of impose itself as something to notice, though I didn't then have the vocabulary to make sense of it, was putting side by side Picasso or Juan Gris on one side and the French cubists, uh, someone like Brock. There is a striking distance and a difference in exactly these terms, right? That Brock's sort of digestion of Cezanne much more easily eventuates in a kind of geometrical formalism, uh, whereas Picasso's uh, sort of harder digestion of Goya seems still to be there in some of the elements he's, he's working through. Um, next question from, uh, from Ian, um, who suggests that, uh, that uh, as, as we mentioned in passing, one way to try to make, to take Goya whole uh, would be to turn to biography, which is very much, very much what you don't do. Um, the, uh, maybe you can say more about that sort of 
registration, but not not absorption uh, within within biography. The sort of working working through the goya that's here. Yeah, yeah, I'm happy to um, uh, along, <clears throat> along the way in, in working on goya. Of course, I read every account of his work that I could get my hands on, and I found that many of them moved in what I characterize as a centrifugal direction. They say they they moved away from the work and they invoked those elements away from the work that were related to it in somehow as the terms by and through which to explain the work. And that that kind of operation has a certain plausibility about it. Um, So the work could be explained by biography, by where he was living, by who was paying him, by who he was in love with, by what commission he got, by whether, you know, when he went to France in exile, all those biographical elements could explain the work and for many do explain the work. So to uh, the facts of history surrounding him, so to his social moment, all of these factors could and do to some extent explain the work. But what I found in critical accounts is that they very often took us outside the work. And they didn't give the work enough of a chance to say, I'm answering back. I'm not just, I'm not just a function of the biography of the person who made me. I'm not just a function of the, these historical circumstances. I'm actually involved in and thinking them through and responding to them. So understanding the way in which the work is, in fact, an engaged response to the things that are conventionally thought to explain it was one of the keys for me to understanding Goya's project of critique. Yeah. Could you say more about the sort of historical um, version of that? We have, of course, the sort of searing uh, historical paintings around 1808 and, and the sort of tumultuous uh, period, uh, sort of post-Napoleonic uh, era in, in Spain in Spain generally. Um, and that effect of, of the sort of recentering uh, of the image that you talk about in relation to biography seems, as, as you suggest, uh, even, even perhaps more intensely true uh, with some of the historical, this historical images. Um, the, what sense of Goya as historical actor and observer um, emerges when we don't merely uh, try to use the paintings to illustrate the events, uh, but instead sort of think the history through through the paintings. Uh, let me let me say two things uh, about that. Uh, one one has to do with Spain at this particular historical juncture, uh, which is to say, at a juncture of great tumult in Europe, a, a juncture of great tumult that is quite often marked as a turn an important turn in the, uh, in the course of modernity. So where does Spain stand in the course of history uh, in these decades, uh, tumultuous decades of modernity at this moment? And where does Spain stand uh, in relation to other countries in Europe that seem very much to be driving history? And we think especially of the French Revolution driving history. Uh, and I think Goya found himself by virtue of circumstances at a very complex historical moment. That is to say, understanding that Spain, which was not on the forefront of modernity and the enlightenment um, was, uh, was an implausible alternative to this forward, rapidly forward moving history, but also that there were enormous problems with this forward moving history that you see reflected in the images of the second and third of May, those grand historical uh, canvases that I think you were, were referring to. Uh, specifically, and I, th- I know we're running a little bit uh, short on time here, but specifically, if you look at these, the, the uprisings of the second of May, it's chaos. And the task of representing what, actu- what happened at this moment with clarity, uh, with a clear vision rendered in paint is extraordinarily difficult. And I think that's in fact what Goya shows us. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Suggests too, perhaps another, another sort of buried, buried commonality of historical situation. Uh, if we think about the German recourse and perhaps comparable um, position of sort of semi-peripherality or, or what have you. Uh, the very different, differently arranged to the Spanish one. 
um, there seems a kind of a kind of analytic advantage, uh, perhaps, in being being forced to to process and to and to conceive um, the history marching in real time from a slight distance uh, or from a slightly different uh, historical situation. Sadly, um, certainly for me, uh, we're to the end of the hour. Uh, so I, I want merely to thank Tony again, um, both for this event, but uh, and also uh, for for the book, and again to uh, to uh, let everyone else um, have a look at it and uh, and um, the uh, to commend it to commend it obviously to your continued uh, attention beyond beyond now. So thanks to everyone. Thank you, Dan. Thank you so much. It's been thank great. You.